Oh, you can ask you better than that. Good evening! Good evening! So, as I said, my name's Simon, and I've been asked to come and share a few thoughts about what might be happening in the property market and what's going to be a great strategy moving forward. Would anyone like to know what's happening in the property market? Show of hands, please. Yeah, me too. Because I don't know. And the fact is, nobody knows what's going to happen. Now, I've been investing in property since 1995. I bought a property back in Selly Oak in Birmingham, just next to Birmingham University, where I studied as an engineer, or trained to be an engineer for four years, came out of university in 94 with no job. It wasn't a good time to get a graduate job, unfortunately. And after a year trying, I got a really, really good job as a graduate trainee at Cadbury's in 1995. And as soon as I bought my first, as soon as I got my first job, I bought my first home. A home to me to live in, and I rented out two of the rooms to my friends who are still at university. Now, I had a, a reasonable salary at Cadbury's, and so I was kind of keeping most of my salary because I was kind of living for free. I had a part-time business, I've always been quite entrepreneurial. I had a business running student nightclub events in Birmingham which is a great fun cash business. And um, I started to sort of build up this money in my um, business bank account. And this, I used bank with Lloyd's, and this was back in the day, uh, in uh, 1997, when you actually knew who your bank manager was. Anyone remember those days? It doesn't really happen much these days. Um, and my bank manager said to me, he said, Simon, what do you like to do with all this money in your account? And I said, well, you know, I might like to do some investments. He said, would you like me to get the top financial advisor in the Midlands region for Lloyd's Bank to come and speak to you. I thought, oh, that's amazing. So this guy, Kevin, very, very smart guy, top financial advisor in Lloyd's Midlands group, came around and sat down in my home in Selly Oak. And he said, look, Simon, do you, do you have a pension? I didn't. Do you have life insurance? I didn't. So he helped me put these things in place. Then he said, what are you going to do with these savings in your bank? And I said, well, you know, I, I've lived here for a few years, but it's a bit closer to the students, and I think I want to move closer to where I work at Cadbury's. And uh, so Kevin said, okay, how much is this house worth, and, and how much is your mortgage, and how much is the house you want to buy? So he gave me his figures, and he wrote down a few things, and said, Simon, I've got some great news for you. He said, you can sell this house, and with the equity you've got, plus your savings in, in your business bank account, you could go and buy your new house and you'll only need a very small mortgage. And you can pay that down quickly, and that means you'll have a lot more money in later life. Because isn't that what we're told to do as homeowners? We're taught to pay down mortgages, yeah? And if you can, by the way, if you're only ever gonna have one home, one property your home, one of the best things you can do is pay that mortgage down as quick as you possibly can. It's a very good thing to do. But I said to Kevin, I said, Kevin, no, um, I don't think I want to do that. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, what I want to do is, I don't want to sell this house. I want to keep this house. I'm going to move to the new one, which is close to the work. My friends are going to live with me. And this house here, I'm going to rent to students. Because we're just down the road from Birmingham University, where I studied, and I think it would work really well as an investment property. Now, Kevin was a financial advisor, an FA, one of the top FAs in the entire Lloyds group in that particular year, 1997. And he looked at it. Now, Kevin was a smart guy. Kevin had those kind of half rim glasses that, that doctors and professors have, you know what I mean? And he looked down his nose over his glasses at me and said, hey, on a minute. so you're telling me you want to keep this house, buy another one to move into, and rent this house out? And I said, yes, that's right. And he looked at me for what seemed like a very long time. It was probably only 30 seconds. He looked at me. <coughs> then he took his glasses off. And I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble here. I, I had flashbacks to school, right? And, and he said, that sounds awfully risky to me. Now, imagine you were there with me, sitting on this sofa. I was probably... I know, 26, 27 at the time. And you're top, the top financial advisor in the Midlands area for Lloyds Bank is saying what you're about to do sounds really risky. Imagine you were sitting there being, what would you do? And I must admit, for probably a day or so, I was thinking, oh, should I really, should I really do it on my eye? I don't know. And then I remembered meeting my very first landlord. 
I come from Kent originally, we've lived with mum and dad, came to Birmingham University in 1990. I stayed in a hall of residence for two years because I had a four year course, and my third year I moved out. And um, I used to live, does anyone know Birmingham, Birmingham University at all? Okay. So uh, I lived on the Vale, which is a lovely green campus, lovely lake. And just around the corner from there in Edgebaston is a road called Farquhar Road. Yeah. It's a very, very posh road. And uh, so we, we walked around Selly Oak, found this house, and I found the house. And so I got the choice of the best room, which is always, a good, always good to be an action taker. There were some benefits of that. And um, so we had to go and visit the landlord at his home on Farquhar <coughs> Road. So I walked down this lovely long road, these huge houses. If, if we looked at a, a house like that, we'd say there could be four flats in that house, or five flats, but no, there were big houses. And I uh, went in the house, and um, through, the, through the front door, on the left-hand side went in, there was a study, and in the study there were <coughs> to ceiling bookshelves all around three of the walls and there was a big bay window and a big oak desk, a big leather chair and then four little chairs in front of the desk. He obviously knew something about negotiation. And so we sat down, me and my friends, signing these contracts, ASD contracts, and um, being a, a cheeky and a 19 year old at that time, I said to him, excuse me, I hope you don't mind me asking this, this is a lovely house, what do you do for a living? And he said, well, I used to be a solicitor. And we all know solicitors are very, very smart, very well paid people, right? And then he said, but now I'm just a full-time landlord. Now, I didn't know what that meant at the time, but I thought, okay, that's interesting. And then I remembered, I had a bit of a flashback to this when I was thinking about, should I be buying a student, should I rent this student house out? And I remember this guy lives in a very, very big house. He seemed to do very, very well for himself. And I thought, what could go wrong? What's the worst that can happen? Now, I know most people in this room are pretty experienced investors already, but I meet a lot of people who are new to property. They're worried about, well, what happens if you can't find tenants, or the tenants don't pay you the rent, or they trash the house, and all those things could happen. But you know what? Sometimes we have fear, it's just in our heads. And, and those things don't generally happen. They could, but they don't generally. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to give it a try. What's the worst that can happen? If it doesn't work, I could always sell it. So I called Kevin up and said, no, no, I want to I do this again. And he said, okay, well, we'll do it for you. And, and buy to let mortgage were just coming in. So I had to put down 30% deposit because I've got a residential mortgage on that second property. 30% was quite a lot of money at the time, um, percentage-wise. And I bought that second house. And I moved into it. And guess what? I rented out my student house. And I found tenants really easily. And they didn't trash the house. They had parties, obviously. They didn't trash it. And I got paid the rent every single month. In fact, Usually mum and dad were the people who paid me the rent every month. And it really wasn't very bad at all. And working at Cadbury's at the time, I was still on the graduate scheme. In 1998, I was earning about £1,500 um, from my job at Cadbury's. But I was putting in, I don't know, 200 plus hours a month. And I looked at my student property that was making me about £500 a month. But I only put two hours in, if that. And I kind of thought, hang on a minute, there's something wrong here. And I thought, job, property, job, which would I rather do? Now, I loved my job. I love Cadbury's, great company, great people, great product. Mm. <laughs> but I kind of like my freedom a bit more. I don't know, who, who, who here works for someone else? Show of hands. Or who has worked for someone else, right? Who's had their own business, okay? And who's not going to put their hand up no matter what I ask? <laughs> if you work for someone else, it's quite nice to have that regular paycheck coming in, right? But they only let you go on holiday a certain amount of time. Isn't that unreasonable? And you have to turn up each day in order to be paid. I mean, how unreasonable is that? So I kind of like my freedom a bit more. So what I love cameras, I thought, you know, I'm going to buy some more of these. And I bought some more houses. Now that first house was actually a student HMO. Only a three bed, but it was technically an HMO. I don't think they'd invented the term HMO back in 1998, but it was an HMO. And then I went on to buy some more singlets, because that's what most people do, right? I didn't know what I was doing, just bought a few more. And by 2001, I was able to leave my full time job. I hadn't completely replaced my income, but I had enough to live on. I knew that property worked. It took me a couple more years, by 2003, I completely replaced my income. Now, I'm telling you the story for a couple of reasons. One reason is that 
My very first house I bought in 1995, I had no money at all. I had come out of university, I was in debt, I had to borrow the deposit. Now, I had a good job, I was able to get a 95% mortgage and the house was 48,500 pounds then, but I still didn't have the several thousand pound deposit and the legal costs and things to buy that house, so I borrowed that money. It wasn't a gift, it was a loan. I had to pay it, I had to pay it back. And the reason I tell you that is because many investors think they have to have money to invest. And if you have a, a successful business, it's really smart to take your profit, put it into assets that are gonna grow for you, or people save their money, or they inherit money. And you know, if you look at the Times Rich List, probably about 66% of the people on there have either made their money in property or have made money and put it into property. Because we all know it's, it's the favorite asset of the rich. But you don't have to be rich to invest in property. And the challenge is most people will run out of their own money at some point. What I was doing was I had this first house, I moved out, bought a second one. As the values went up, I'd remortgage, take a bit more money out, go and buy another house, then wait a few more years, go, and it was a slow way to build your portfolio. But what we heard earlier from Ryan, which was very true, if you can find a house preferably one that needs a bit of work doing to it, that's below market value from a motivated seller, then maybe we can buy that, we can add value to it, and the money we spend is less than the value we create, so we can then refinance it, take the money out, and then go and buy another property. Or if we borrowed the money from someone, pay it back from the person we borrowed to, and maybe it's your own home, maybe you've had a drawdown facility, you used some money, you put it in, get an investment property, then take it out to pay off your home loan. So this is what I've learned kind of over time. And it turns out that Kevin, the FA, that's how much he knew about property. <laughs> and you've got to be very careful who you listen to. Because you might have family members, you might have friends, professional advisors, solicitors, bank managers, accountants, who mean well and they, they're trying to look after you, but they don't know what they're talking about. So when you get advice from someone about property, you need to make sure they know what they're talking about. They've been there, they've done what you want to achieve, and they can hopefully give you some, some guidance and inspiration. And I'm really, thank you Dawn for asking me to come and speak. I want to give you a couple of golden nuggets to take away. And it's great that you know, Dawn's pretty experienced in property, as you know, um, but Dawn came with some of my training. We were able to teach her a few things she didn't know, which is always good when someone's experienced in property. Good feeling that. So anyway, um, to move the story forward, uh, in 2003, I had completely replaced my income, and uh, I was still doing my property, I was dabbling in my property, and I was doing my club business, and I realized that I'd done quite well, but I also made lots of mistakes. Anyone else in the room made lots of mistakes? Yeah, stupid things, because you just don't know what you don't know. And I realized I could probably learn a bit more, and I started investing in myself. I started going to personal development uh, events, uh, listening to audio, there were audio cassettes at the time, it was before CDs, I'm showing my age now. Um, people like Brian Tracy, um, Bob Proctor, Tony Robbins, have you heard about these kind of people? Yeah. You know, they talk about mindset, and, and I just really realised the value of investing in myself. And um, so I went online to see if there's some sort of group I could join for property investors. And there was nothing anywhere in the UK. So I set up something called the Property Investors Network. It was one meeting in Birmingham on the Hagley Road in the Plough and Harrow Hotel. And it was a handful of, probably about as many people as there are here actually. And then now we have 50 meetings. Who's been to a pin meeting before? Okay, who's not been yet? Do you see what I did there? <laughs> By the way, write this down. I hope you've got pen and paper or just drop things in your phone. Write down PIN, P-I-N. When I say write down, it means actually write it down. PIN, P-I-N, meeting.co.uk. 50 meetings around the country. It's 20 pounds to come to me, but you can come to the first one completely free. So you go to pinmeeting.co.uk, look for your local meeting, and then, Dawn's trying to get us to open one in Shropshire, actually. And then um, scroll down to where your local meeting is, and when it comes to the payment page, click on where it says pay with a voucher code, and if you use my surname, which is Zuchi, write this down, Z-U-T-S-H-I, you can come to your very first meeting for free. And it's a bit like this, we have guest speakers, we talk about um, uh, different, different strategies, we have a mortgage broker, etc. cetera. By the way, I picked up most of uh, Ryan's talk, spot on, Ryan, I agree with everything you said, so really good. Um, wasn't it great to hear from Jeanine as well? Obviously really experienced. 
And coming along to, you should come to this every time they have this meeting. Because all you need is one little idea that could make you or save you thousands of pounds. Something that Janine mentioned that um, uh, an EPC inspector told me was that thing about, you know, you might go and get the latest boiler, uh, electric heater, and thinking it's a, it's a really efficient, great product. But guess what? If it's not being checked and approved on their computer system, the computer's going to say, ah, ah, and you spend all that money and it's not going to be worth it. Which is, and it's crazy that the government would bring this regulation in and their system is so completely outdated. But we could talk about that for hours, couldn't yeah, we? But still, could. anyway, could. Let's, let's move on because that could be a whole night, but still. So, um, where was it going? Yeah, so come, come to this meeting, come to PIN meetings, educate yourself, talk to each other. The more you learn from other people, the more successful you will be. And so I started these meetings and, and people would say to me, Simon, how come, how come you don't have to work? And I said, well, I do. I do my properties, I do my clubs. I said, no, no, no. You don't go to work. Now, this was 2003. This was before all the TV programs about property. You know, the internet was up and around, but um, things like White Group were fairly new still. And I started to explain what I had done, and I realized, actually, I, I quite enjoy doing that. So for the last almost 20 years now, I've been teaching other people how to become successful <laughs> investors, and do it much, much quicker than I did. It took me eight years to replace my income, some of my students have done it in eight months, which is pretty impressive, really. So I know some people in the room might have built portfolios over the last 10, 20 years or so. We've had people who come and do my year-long training. They've been investing 20 years, and in a year, they get re-energized, they, get, they learn the new strategies, and they double up in a year what took them 20 years previously. And I don't know about you, but I value my time. Time's our most valuable asset. And for me, it's not about owning lots of property. I think back to my, my original landlord who lived on Farquhar Road. He did very well for himself, but he was what I call a full-time landlord. If we had a problem, who did we call? We called Mr. Horwich Smith. Now, he'd get someone else to come and sort out the problem, but he, he, he sorted out the contracts. He would chase the rent if it was late. He would go around and inspect the properties. He would organize the maintenance. He had 100 properties. Probably worth about 40 or 50 million pounds now in Selly Oak. But he's not with us anymore, unfortunately. But 100 properties. It was a full-time job. Now, I don't want to ask you if you're self-managing, but my view is you should get a good letting agent to do it for you. If I was managing my, I don't have 100, but I've got quite a few. If I was managing, it would be a full-time job. Personally, I don't want to manage property. I think, oh, it sucks. I don't want to do that. I've got much better things to do in my time. I want to travel, I want to, you know, now, oh, I tell you what, lockdown, it almost killed me. I think my wife almost killed me as well, you know what, but, but I like to travel a lot. And if you're some distant part of the world, sunning yourself, I have to be very careful, I go pink and crispy on beaches, but, but the point is, if you're on holiday, you don't want to get a call from your tenant, because it's 11 of 30 back in England on a Thursday night, and it's raining, and they've lost their key. Yeah, I'll, I'll come around in two weeks when I'm back. It's not going to be a good answer. So get other people. Now, I managed my properties at first for a couple of reasons. First of all, I was, I was wanting to replace my income. And I didn't want to give 10% to someone else. And back then, early 2000s, I thought, you know what, I could do a better job than letting agents. Letting agents are much, much better now than they used to be. Would you agree, Dawn? Yes. There, there were still some pretty sh- shaky ones out there, but they're generally much better than they used to be. And also, I thought, you know what, I want to get to know my tenants. No, you don't. <laughs> Believe me, that novelty soon wears off. Okay? And so, so I, and I realised now, by the way, you can absolutely manage a few properties. Who, I don't know who is still, who has managed a few properties in the past? Yeah, you can absolutely, even if you've got a full-time job, you can manage a few. But here's the thing, as you buy more and more properties, it takes more and more time to manage those properties. And actually, you then have less and less time to go out and buy the properties. Now, a little bit of a quiz here, see if you've been listening. Do you think you make more money managing properties or buying properties? What do you reckon? Buying. Buying. It's the buying where you make, especially if you can buy below market value. And it wasn't until 2005, I've been investing 10 years, I looked back. And up to that point, I had one HMO, this original house, I was renting out to three, everything else was single lets. And I looked back. And I thought, you know what? That one first HMO was my most profitable property and my least hassle. 
it really didn't take a lot of work. So in 2005, I decided to buy a lot more HMOs. I was buying three bedroom houses, turned them into five bedroom HMOs, um, and massively increased my income, which was pretty good. And then in 2006, 11 years after I started investing, I learned about motivated sellers. Now, who's, they were mentioned a bit tonight, who's heard about motivated sellers? Right? Okay. Who, who hasn't heard about motivated sellers? Okay, let me tell you what this is. There are some people who, for whatever reason, they want to get rid of their property quickly. Now, maybe, maybe there's some financial challenges. Maybe they're facing repossession. Maybe the interest rate is too expensive. They can't afford to hold that property anymore. That might be an interesting one right now. Maybe they're getting divorced. And they've got this property, and the last thing holding this couple together is this property, they just want to get rid of it. Maybe for medical reasons, someone has to move to the coast. Maybe someone is downscaling. Maybe it's good reasons. Maybe two people have met, they fall in love, they've both got a house, they don't want to become a landlord, they just want to sell that one and, and live their dreams. There are all sorts of reasons why people need to sell quickly. And a big one right now. We are seeing more and more landlords, I think Brian mentioned it, more and more landlords than ever before wanting to retire early. Now in any industry, there are always people coming in, starting, and there are always people exiting. That's always going to happen. But there are more and more retiring for a number of really good reasons. It started in April 2017, when the government introduced Section 24. And I'm sure you all know, but very briefly, if you own property in your own name, which was always the best way to do it, the most tax efficient way, and if you have mortgages, which many landlords do, and if you're a higher rate taxpayer, which not all, but again, many landlords are, you pay a lot more tax if you own it in your own name. So some people have incorporated, put their properties into company, some have done all sorts of clever things, some have started to sell properties, and you know, we're seeing a lot who decided or have been deciding to retire. And Section 24 was phased in over four years, so people didn't really feel the effect until a couple of years in. How many in the room, how many of you felt the effects of Section 24? Yeah? Okay, that's, that's one characteristic. Now, the government, bless them, have not exactly been landlord friendly over the last few years. Lots of extra regulations, things coming in, you know, EPCs, talking about getting rid of Section 21, are we not gonna get rid of it? Who knows what's going on? And all these things happen, and it's because the government doesn't really want people like us to be landlords. What they want is institutions and corporate bodies because they're easier to tax and easier to regulate. Apparently, would you believe it, some landlords don't pay the tax they're supposed to pay. <laughs> Shocking, I know, but that's one of the reasons this is all happening. And so because of that, more and more lands are looking to retire. And then look at what's happened. The last 12 years, we've had fantastic capital growth. And who's buying properties kind of 2010, 2011, they probably, if they bought wisely, they've probably seen the value of their property double in value. And yet now, they've got this Section 24, so if they own in their own name, even if they're making money, um, not making money on, uh, physically, the taxman says you're still making a profit. And with interest rates going up, a lot of people on variable rates who've been used to record low rates for such a long time are seeing their profits being squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. So we are seeing more and more landlords sell up. Now, I felt that in, I felt that in 2020, when COVID hit, and we'd had 10 years of great growth, I thought, this is it. No one knows what's gonna happen. Furlough, we are gonna see a property crash by the end of 2020, because furlough's gonna end in September. There are gonna be lots of people who are suddenly mighty unemployed. People are not gonna be able to afford their mortgages. The world is going to end. Did anyone else think that? Yeah? I was wrong. Because the government, to be fair, responded very well. They know how important the housing sector is to this country, housing and retail. And retail was screwed, so housing was the only thing they could really support. By bringing the stamp duty holidays, by um, extending furlough, by bringing in bounce back loans, which obviously weren't meant to be used in property, but I bet a lot of them were. <laughs> You know, there was this unexpected boom. 
And then we've got this real frenzy. And how many of you found it hard to find good investments over the last couple of years? Because the market was so crazy, right? And it was definitely a seller's market, wasn't it? Yeah? But with interest rates starting, I mean, earlier this year, I was telling all of my clients, I said, guys, if you've got variable mortgages, now my, I can't give you advice. From an education point of view, you might want to speak to your broker and you might want to fix in some of those rates. I'm sure you experienced that as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I had people who were actually saying, you know what, I'm actually going to break some of my early redemption penalties just to fix in rates, and they are really, really pleased that they did that. But rates have started to go up. And particularly the last, let's say, three weeks, where we've had political instability. And the news today might mean there's some stability coming, which is good. But the banks, as we heard earlier, have just gone crazy. The interest rates are not only really high, but more importantly, the stress test. The stress test is the, the interest rate they use. They use a multiplier of that to make sure that the rental income coming in is going to be enough to cover the mortgage in case rates go up. I heard, and I've got two properties at the moment, uh, two HMOs on remortgaging. It's been taking ages. Um, because solicitors take a long time and mortgage companies take a long time. And I had one single let, uh, and also I had um, a single that was going to sell, but so I'd not sell if I could hold it. And my broker said, Simon, you can't do anything on a single let. So when I'm just finally going to keep it, when I've come to the end of the term, I've gone back to the letter, just going to extend it for 10 years. Um, the HMO is fine. But this is the important thing. He said, I've got all these cases on my desk, which I just cannot get mortgages for. There are, my little prediction is, this next month, we are going to see a lot of properties that have been sold come back onto the market. I think the national statistic is about one in three sales fall through, and it's normally due to difficulty getting finance. But I think we'll see even more property coming back on the market because sales are falling through. That's for investors trying to buy singlets, and also homeowners trying to buy who are not going to be able to afford, show the affordability. I mean, it's difficult anyway with high prices. That's, going to, so that's my little prediction. I might be wrong, but I think it's going to happen. Now, in the UK, we fundamentally do not have enough accommodation. You can go and Google this, the government believe we need 300,000 homes each year. We're only building 200,000, do the maths. This is why over the long term, property prices in the UK go up. And with this um, inflation we have, over 10%, you know, that helps prices go up. And inflation is actually good for us as investors. Because it means our rents go up, it means our values go up, and also that Inflation erodes the real value of our debt. So that goes down over time as well. So inflation is actually good for us. But I feel that we might be at a tipping point. I felt a month ago that we weren't going to get a crash. We might just see prices correct a little bit. But I don't know anymore. And it depends how quickly the mortgage lenders stabilize. And interesting, I'll tell you, I, I shared this with Mike on the way here from the train station. Uh, I'm actually, I live in a rented house at the moment. My wife and I are looking for the dream home because I, I sold my business early this year. So we're looking to buy a really nice home and I'm not going to buy it cash. It's crazy. So I'm going to get a mortgage. So I spoke to my bank. I've got a new bank I'm working with and I called them up and I said, look, I want to buy this kind of quite big valuable house. By the way, guess where I'm looking? Farquhar Road. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, it's not, I thought I'd tell you, it completes a circle. I, I, I hope we get this, this property. You know, and by the way, when you're looking for your own home, totally different to buying an investment, as we know. And my wife said to me, don't fuck this up, Simon. <laughs> Sorry for swearing, but I'm just giving you the true quotes, okay? So, uh, and I, I've had that, so I've, I've been married once before and I've had a few relationships and, and uh, I tend to give those properties to those ex-partners. So, I'm <laughs> saying, I'm going to fuck my room. We're staying together forever. <laughs> so anyway, so, uh, and I've been told not to mess it up before. So anyway, um, I spoke to my bank and, and so they said something to me that I was ne I've never, ever heard in the last 27 years of investing, what they said was this, and this is good for us. This might give you some peace of mind. We'll keep an eye on time. And that is, so normally when we have a variable mortgage that goes up and down, that's a certain rate. Now if you have a fixed mortgage for maybe two years, normally the fixed mortgage is a slightly higher rate than the variable. Would you agree, yes? Yeah. yeah. And then if you had a five year fix, normally that's even higher interest rate. Would you agree? Yeah. Yes? That's because banks say, well, we don't know what's gonna happen in the future, so we're gonna price it a bit more just to make sure we're covered, okay? The swap rates and things. 
So this bank, this broker for this bank said to me, well, the variable's this. I said, no, I don't really want to do a variable. I want to do a fixed um, probably for five years. And he said, well, the two-year fix is X amount. And the five-year fix was less money. So to me, that suggests that they feel, okay, interest rate's a bit of a mess right now. They might go a bit higher. But that suggests they feel, and this is a pretty well-known bank, they feel that actually rates are going to come down a bit and stabilize. And uh, on my training courses, I mentioned Dawn some of those, I always teach my students to use a 6% to calculate if something stacks up, if it makes money or not. Okay? Um, and so actually, all of my mortgages are fine because none of them are 6% yet, um, and my clients are the same. Um, but that's been the rate we've always used. And so I think rates probably will go up, they'll come down, and I think they'll probably settle to the, the pre- um, global financial crisis of 20, uh, 2007, 2008, I think about five and a half, six percent is probably where we'll settle down. So I think you should be um, having a, a higher rate than maybe you've been used to over the last 10 years. So this all leads up to what's going to happen next year and what's happening at the moment. Well, again, uh, uh, thanks for lining this up for me so well, Ryan, but I agree with Ryan. I think in difficult times, um, who, who feels we're going into recession, or we're in recession, yeah? Now, oh, that's pretty wealthy people, it may not affect you, but the mere mortals, they are feeling it. I really feel there are a lot of people who are gonna have a really, really difficult Christmas with energy prices. I mean, inflation is supposed to be 10.1%, I think, the last time I looked. It's gotta be more than that. Have you seen how much it is to buy stuff in supermarkets? Look at cost of petrol, obviously energy costs as well. So I think inflation is far higher than that. So there's high inflation, interest rates are going up accordingly because of that. Um, and I think a lot of people are gonna struggle. So in difficult times, people have to pull their belts in. Living on your own in an apartment or studio, where you've also gotta pay the bills in addition to the rent is actually quite expensive. And those people have two choices. They could move back and live with mum and dad. Mum and dad might not be so happy about that, but that might be a choice. But mum and dad might live in a different city. So actually, the other option is those people to share. They could buddy up with a friend and share maybe, or they could move into a formal shared house, a house of multiple occupation, HMO. Now, most letting agents don't understand HMOs because they seem very complicated. And they are definitely more work than a single let. Luckily, Dawn and the team do get it because I've trained them about HMOs. And I tell you, HMOs, I believe, is a recession-proof strategy because when people have to cut back, it's a more affordable form of accommodation. And also, we saw after COVID where people were um, felt very isolated, living on their own, living in bubbles. And they might live in a block of 200 flats. You can't go and speak to your neighbours. You have to stay in your flat. So we saw a lot of people come out of those, come into HMOs. Now, I just want to give you a caveat here. There is a whole world of different... People talk about HMOs, there's a huge different range of types of HMO. There's what's called a minimo, which might be a three-bedroom property, which technically is an HMO, three or more unrelated people sharing. That might make about £500 a month. You have a standard HMO, five, six people, might make about £1,000. This is profit, not rent, this is profit. How does that compare to some of your single legs? A larger HMO, you know, seven, eight, nine people should make a couple of thousand pounds profit a month. And then over 10 people could be making what I call a mega deal, three to 5,000 pounds profit per month. That is a life changing deal. And those of you, now, some of you might have enough property, you might even be selling a few properties. For those of you who want to scale up and do more, why go and buy another 10 houses when you could buy one really big one? And it won't cost as much as 10 houses. It's not as much work as 10 houses. It's just about gaining the specialist knowledge about how to do these things. And I believe if we're going into difficult times, recessions, there are three criteria you need to look for for recession-busting strategies. The first criteria, there must be high demand. And there is high demand for good quality HMOs. And that's a distinction I want to make. If you go onto spareroom.co.uk, which is the website where most landlords advertise their rooms, you will see the general standard of HMOs is not very good. And I am not saying you should have that kind of accommodation.
because there's lots of competition and landlords compete on price. That is the wrong way to do it. I'm talking about having very high-end accommodation. Once we walk in and say, actually, I wouldn't mind living here myself. That kind of standard, right? And there's something called co-living. So if I'm not just a room and a house, they're actually buying into a community. People cook together, they eat together, and that's what, that's what the trend is. So we have these high living, high, high end HMOs. My students are getting 20 to 30% more rental income than the average ones. And they have people queuing up to come and live in them as well. Whereas other landlords with average HMOs are struggling to rent them out. So you've got you to you, you get some education to learn how to do these things correctly. And actually I've got some, a little video series we put together. So Dawn, I might get you if you want to send it out to us. It's completely free of charge, little three video series all about HMOs and explains about planning and licensing, which put a lot of people off. So who, who'd like that video sort? Of course, yeah, completely free. Maybe we'll sort out a link for people to get that, okay? So you should definitely look into HMOs. I think that's a recession-proof strategy. And also the other thing, I should have paid you for your talk. You like that, would be nice <laughs> Service accommodation, short-term lets, sometimes known as Airbnb, where you rent a property for a very short amount of time. It could be to contractors who are working away from home during the week, they go home on the weekends, or working on a building site, or doing IT. It could be corporate lets. Uh, it could be... Um, could be families on holiday, could be friends coming together. Uh, my sister got married last year in, in a pool at her house. In a pub. We, we didn't all want to descend on their house because they're getting married. So my, me and my wife and my sister and her partner and my mum, we got a three bedroom, a lovely little townhouse right on the pool harbour side. It was amazing. And it was far more cost effective than getting three hotel rooms as well. And much better. So again, it was cost effective for us, but that owner, made a lot of money from that. And there's massive demand. With the cost of, I mean, I've been overseas a few times this year. It's really expensive. Airlines are expensive, hotels are expensive. And I think the middle class is, we will still want to go overseas, but we might have a few more holidays here in the UK. So this idea of this staycation, I think is a real boom. So for my money, and we can come back in a few years, see if I'm right or not, I might not be, I don't know. I think HMOs, high-end HMOs, and I think serviced accommodation, really, really good strategies. Now, they are both require more work. An HMO, one HMO definitely is more work than one single let property. However, that's not a fair comparison because one HMO might make five times <coughs> as much profit as one, H, one, one single let. So really, I think you should compare five single lets to one HMO. And I would say five single lets are more work than one HMO. Or you can give it to someone else who knows how to do it, and it's no, that's what I do. I don't have to manage my properties because someone else does it for me. Likewise, service accommodation. If you do it wrong, you're just giving yourself a busy job. I meet people who are renting out things and they're changing the sheets and go, oh my God, that's not what you want to do. So you've got to treat it like a business, get systems put in place, get people doing for you. A friend of mine has a company and, and they have a load of virtual assistants in the Philippines. They run his entire service accommodation business. They can't do the cleaning, but they organize the cleaners and the maintenance and stuff. And he doesn't have to do anything. He set it up initially, but when he put the right systems in place, it can work very, very well. So the question is, you know, maybe you have enough property, maybe you're very content with what you've got, but if you want to increase your cash flow, and by the way, I think, you know, in, in times like this where landlords have had a good amount of cash coming from their property, and then interest rates go up, suddenly that is affected. So I think having more than you need is probably a good idea. And the ways to add extra cash flow to your portfolio Good, high quality HMOs and service accommodation. That's what I think are, are the main things. So, that's all I wanted to share with you. I've got about five or six minutes to take any questions you would like. When I say any question, it should be property related, I guess, really. <laughs> any, any questions or comments or observations? Is that a question or are you just scratching? I have another question, sorry. Don't you talk about interest rates? Yes. 6%, is that base or are you talk about variable standard? Uh, I, I think the actual pay rates that people will be paying will be about 6% eventually. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. so it might be a discount. Thank, thank God. Yeah. Thank God. Great. Okay, cool. Question over here? On the um, property, um, is it PIN? Is it? PIN, Property Investors Network, yes. yes. Do you 
um, go over sort of financing and um, sort of... We, we have, uh, at all the meetings, we have normally a mortgage broker who talks about, you know, like great presentations today, uh, what's latest in the market, what's going on, what you can do, what you can't do. And we normally have a letting agent as well, who's local to that area. Is for the next book. Yeah. And then we have a couple of different speakers. Okay, go and try it out for yourself. Remember, you go to pinmeeting.co.uk, use my surname as a voucher code, and your very first meeting come for free as our guest. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, how did you fare in the last recession? Uh, I did really well, because I was buying lots of property. So I stopped buying in about 2007, because it didn't stack up. You know, values are shooting up, and, and a lot of people, unfortunately, and um, but who remembers, the, who was buying before the last crash? Right? Who, who's too shy to put that? I know there's some people to be involved, right? No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so, that what happened was that the, the world exploded. And back in those, can you, can you take your hand like this, right? Take your hand, everyone take your hand like this. Hold it in front of your mouth like this and go, <laughs> come on, do this. <laughs> if you could do that in 2003, you could get a mortgage. <laughs> Seriously, so you agree, right? Gina, Gina, I can't right. see it. Anybody, yeah. self-certification, yeah. I can afford it. <laughs> you can buy it, they'll lend you up to 90% on a buy-to-let property. We were doing 15% uh, gifted deposits from developers. No money down property deals. <coughs> the world went crazy. No wonder there was a global financial crisis. There was some very irresponsible lending and some very irresponsible borrowing as well. That, that's not going to happen again because banks are now leaving 75%. But, but, you know, markets are cyclical. They go up, they come down. So at that time, I was okay because I'd stop buying. And some people were buying. And they were buying things that were losing the money every month. They might have to subsidize by 200 pounds. And they're saying, it's okay because it's going up 10 grand a year. I don't mind putting two grand in. Well, that's okay as long as you can afford to do that. If you can't afford them, when the market turns and people lose their jobs, and that thousand pounds a month they're putting into their properties that they don't have anymore, and they can't sell their properties because they bought them overvalued in the first place. That's when the shit hits the fan. And that's, excuse my French, but that's when I wrote this. Who's, who's read Property Magic? Okay. Who's not read Property Magic yet? Okay. You could go and get it on Amazon. Um, you can get Kindle, or if you prefer listening, I love listening to books, you can get an audible version of it. And the one thing I'll tell you about this, so it's all about finding motivated sellers. And I learned about motivated sellers in 2006, and I, I went crazy buying lots of properties then. It's really good. Um, and then people said, how, how can you do that? And I started my mastermind program teaching people how to do that. But I realized in 2007, I'd been investing 12 years, teaching probably about four years by then. I had made loads of mistakes, <coughs> and many people I was teaching, and also I'd seen people make the same mistakes. So I wanted some really simple rules that anybody could use to minimize the risk and maximize the return. Would you like to know what the five golden rules are? Yeah. Well, I've run out of time, so thank you very much. <laughs> I, tell you very, I have to go because I've got to get a taxi in a moment, literally. I've got to get out to Birmingham and my wife will kill me. So, five golden rules. You might want to write these down. They are very simple. Do not be fooled by how simple these are. If you follow these rules, I promise you will be more successful investor. Rule number one. I only want to buy from motivated sellers. People who've got a problem. We're not trying to take advantage of them. We're trying to find a solution where we can give them an ethical win-win. They get what they want, we get what we want. That means they're flexible on the price or they might be flexible on the terms. We might be able to do things like vendor finance where they put the money in for you. We might do things like purchase these songs. You've heard of these things. Yeah, some of you. You need to read the book if you haven't, okay? That's golden rule number one. Golden rule number two. Doesn't matter if you're buying a cheap property if you can't rent it out. There must be strong rental demand for the property you have. Okay, very important. That's why I'm saying you want to do things like HMOs, very strong rental demand if it's good quality. Service accommodation, right location, can work really well. So there must be strong rental demand. Rule number three, linked to number two is everything you buy must give you positive cash flow. The mistake I said in the 2000, 2007, people are subsidizing properties. That is not a good thing. People are banking that their value is gonna go up. And long term, sure enough, it will. But if you can't afford to hold it medium term, you've got a problem. 
So make sure your property is putting cash in your pocket every single month. Otherwise, that is not a good deal. And don't tell me, oh, I'm buying for the capital growth. That may or may not happen. What's real is what you can make right now and goes into your pocket. Golden rule number four is we hold for the long term. I bought properties, I've sold them, I mainly hold. I genuinely regret the properties I've sold, seeing what's happened to values. As long as it makes money, you can refinance it, take the most money out, go and buy another if you want, hold properties. And rule number five, have a cash buffer. Some money put aside to cover unexpected things. Maybe things aren't covered by insurance because if there's a problem, you want to get that problem fixed really quickly so that you can get tenants in there, creating an income for you so it's an asset and not a liability. If you follow the five golden rules and sense check every deal you buy by those, it will make you find better deals, you'll minimize the risks, and you'll maximize your return. And people say, well, Simon, if the market's going to crash down, maybe we should wait until it hits the bottom and then buy. That is a brilliant, brilliant plan. The only problem is nobody knows when it's going to hit the bottom. And when it does hit the bottom, when it does hit the bottom, and everyone knows it's hit the bottom, the public, the press, and the sellers, everyone's got the expectation that someone's going to come and pay more for it. So people are less flexible. So the best time to get the deals was in 2008, 2009. When the market's coming down, most people are running for the hills as long as you know what you're doing. As long as you're following the five golden rules, it's a great time to buy. Now, I don't think we're going to see a really big crash right now. But with all this uncertainty, I think there'll be some landlords who remembered what happened back in 2000, 2009. And their fear is their properties could go down 20, 30% in value. They've had amazing capital, and they might be prepared to sell some of those properties 10, 15% off the current market price. Will everyone do that? No, of course not. But I'm only looking for the 5% who are truly motivated. And they're who I want to, those who I want to deal with. So I've kind of run out of time. I hope that's given you some insights, have been inspirational. Um, go and get a copy of Property Magic. Who like the, who liked the copy of this book? Who would like this copy of this book? Who would like the copy of this book? Who would like the copy of this book? thinking about what you want, but at the end of the day, you need to get up and take some action. Thank you so much for asking me, Dawn, and all the best investors.